We have again a very stellar lineup of speakers, as always, uh, beginning with uh, Manik Parma from Microsoft Research. Uh, Manik uh, started out his career as a vision researcher, but has moved now to you know, interest in uh, ML, and he does some very interesting, in fact, the smart cane videos that were playing earlier and which Sriram played in his talk, you know, he's involved in that project too. Uh, uh, but this talk that he's gonna uh, do today is, uh, is focused on uh, some very interesting work that he's been doing now for uh, many years on extreme classification. So without much further ado, I'll hand it over to Manik. Thank you, Satish. Um, right, so I'm Manik Varma from MSR India, and I'm also an adjunct faculty at IIT Delhi. And uh, again, before I start my talk, vote for PGM. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to say I'll be talking about extreme classification, which is a new research area in machine learning that we started in 2013, and which has also opened up a new paradigm for thinking about key applications in our industry, such as ranking and recommendation. This is a joint project with my PhD students at IIT Delhi, Kunal Dahiya, Himanshu Jain, and Yashoteja Prabhu, as well as my colleague, uh, colleagues at Bing Ads, Rahul Agarwal and Shutendra Harsola, and with Anil Kag, who is a research fellow here uh, at MSR India with me. Now, some of you might not have heard the term extreme classification before, so let me start by giving some context. In classification, the complexity of the learning task has grown from binary classification, where we learn to pick a single item from two labels, to multi-class classification, where we learn to pick an item from more than two labels, to multi-label classification, where we learn to pick the most relevant subset of these labels. At the same time, the complexity of the learning task has also grown in terms of the number of labels being considered. So we've moved on from working with two labels for binary classification to working with tens to hundreds and even thousands of labels for multi-class and multi-label learning. And if you looked at the state of the art in 2012, then the largest multi-label data set had 5,000 labels, and so the size of the output space was two to the power 5,000, which is quite large, and so going beyond that was considered very hard. Then in WWW 2013, we published a paper which exploded the number of labels being considered in a multi-label classifier from 5,000 to 10 million. The motivating application was to build a classifier that could automatically predict the subset of millions of Bing queries that might potentially lead to a click on a new ad. So we wanted to build a tool for advertisers such as Geico, so that when they created an ad like this, they could use our tool to figure out which Bing queries might lead to a click on the ad, and then Geico could bid on these queries, and then if the query got asked on Bing and the bid was high enough, then the ad might get shown. Now, as you can well imagine, predicting queries from ads and web pages is a really important problem from both a commercial and a research perspective, uh, perspective. And so many sophisticated NLP, machine learning, and IR techniques have been developed in the literature. However, we decided to avoid all these approaches and simply formulated the problem by taking the top 10 million monetizable queries on Bing and treating each one of them as a separate label in an extreme multi-label classifier. So we learned a, a multi-label random forest classifier called MLRF, which would take this ad as input extract a bag of words feature vector from the raw HTML underlying the ad, and then simply classify the feature vector into the subset of top 10 million Bing queries that might lead to a click. Now this was a completely new and very different way of thinking about the problem, and as a result, ML MLRF gave significantly higher precision and coverage as compared to leading techniques that were in production in Bing at that point of time. So as I mentioned, MLRF was published in WWW 2013, and it started this area of extreme classification, which deals with multi-class and multi-label problems involving millions of labels. And since 2013, extreme classification has come to be a thriving area of research in both academia and industry. So students are now doing PhDs in the area, and publications are coming out at not only top-tier machine learning and artificial intelligence conferences, but also in top-tier applied conferences. Eight very popular workshops have been uh, organized in the area over the last five years. And if you turned up to the NIPS Extreme Classification Workshop held last month, you would have found about 200 people from leading companies and universities at the workshop. And if you would like to carry out research in this area, then you might want to go and check out the Extreme Classification Repository, which we maintain and where we make freely available code, data sets, benchmark results, etc., 
which make it very easy for new researchers to come in and get started in this area. Also what we have come to realize since 2013 is that extreme classification generalizes far beyond being a simple tool for advertisers. In fact, one of the most interesting questions to have come out of our research, I think, is when or where in the world will you ever have 10 million labels to choose from? What are the applications of extreme classification? Well, if you think about it, 10 million is a really large number. Even if it were to take you just one second in order to read out a label, it would take you almost four months to go through a list of 10 million labels without eating or sleeping. Right? And to just put things in perspective, when I was doing my PhD, Jitendra Malik and Pietro Perona would get up and tell the computer vision community that according to Biedemann, there are only 60,000 object categories in the world. So almost none of the computer vision problems will make the cut. And even if you were to pick up an English language dictionary, it would only have between 100,000 to 500,000 words in it, depending on which dictionary you picked up. And so many NLP problems will also not make the cut. Nevertheless, people have found high impact applications of extreme classification over the last five years in various areas ranging from information retrieval to recommender systems to NLP and vision and even bioinformatics for that matter. So for the rest of the talk, I'll be focusing on some of these applications. And in order to discuss them, I'll be switching to the language of ranking and recommendation. And the way I'll model these applications is that there will be a space of users X and a space of items Y. And what we'd like to do is learn a multi-label classification function F, which is going to take a point in the space of users and map it to a set of points in the space of items. Okay? So that when a new user comes in, we can simply apply our classifier, see which items get predicted, and then return the items to the user either as a recommended bag or as a ranked list depending on the application. So as you can see, extreme classification opens up a new paradigm for reformulating uh, applications such as ranking and recommendation by taking each item to be ranked or recommended and treating it as a separate label in a multi-label classifier. Okay. So let's focus on some of the concrete examples of this uh, uh, reformulation staying with an advertising in Bing to start with. So here is an ad for Tesco's distilled water. And as you can see, the advertiser has bid on just a single query, which is distilled water five liters. And unfortunately, what this implies is that this ad can only get shown if this query gets asked. And so as a result, this ad has not been shown on Bing for the last six months, even though it has been sitting in our inventory all along. So we would like to rectify this problem by predicting the subset of Bing queries that might lead to a click on the ad, and then inserting the queries and the ad into the inverted Bing ad index, so that if one of these queries gets asked, then this ad can get shown automatically, even though the advertiser forgot to uh, uh, bid on the query. Right? So in this case, the input to our extreme classification function f is going to be the ad, and our labels are going to be the top 10 million monetizable queries on Bing. And as I just mentioned, this is uh, not a new problem. We were not the first ones to think of it. And Bing already has an entire ensemble of 50 top-notch algorithms that are just predicting queries from pages based on these sophisticated NLP, machine learning, and IR techniques. But unfortunately, all of them failed in this particular case. They made, Bing made just one recommendation, which is water five which isn't a very good one, uh, if you ask my opinion. Whereas if you look at our predictions, then they're all on the money. So we recommend distilled water, whereby distilled water, distilled water delivery, Tesco's distilled water, and so on. And because of our predictions, this ad has now been shown on Bing multiple times and has received many clicks. So let me take just a moment to reflect on why the traditional approaches don't work well in this particular case and why extreme classification does. And the high level intuition is that a complex machine learning model trained on a lot of data might often outperform a simple one. So the reason the um, traditional approaches don't work is because the traditional approach tries to reduce the complexity of the problem by reducing it to a binary classification task. So the traditional approach learns a binary classifier H, which scans every phrase present on the ad 
in order to determine whether it would make for a good prediction or not. Now, unfortunately, ads are pithy and have very little text on them. So, the binary classifier can never recommend a, or predict a query such as buy distilled water simply because this query never occurs as a phrase on the ad itself. Furthermore, the binary classifier is also low uh, capacity. So, it will often make mistakes, which is what you see in this particular case when it recommends that water 5 is a good query to predict for this particular ad. On the other hand, in extreme classification, we actually embrace the complexity of the problem by testing each ad against all 10 million queries. So, we learn a hierarchy over the space of queries where all 10 million queries are in the root node to start with, but then all the fruit related queries go left and all the engine related queries, battery related queries go right. And then once we've reached right, let's say the car, uh, uh, the, the engine and the, uh, sorry, the battery and the engine oil go left, whereas all the distilled water queries go right. So that when a new ad comes in, we can traverse it down the hierarchy very efficiently in logarithmic time and can accurately predict all the distilled water queries even though they don't occur as phrases on the ad itself. So, our hierarchical algorithm for extreme classification is called Parable and it will be published in WWW uh, 2018. And Parable has a number of advantages over MLRF. First, um, it can be up to 10,000 times faster to train. So, what would take us uh, a few days to train on a 1000 core cluster using MLRF can now be trained in a few hours on a single core of a standard desktop using Parable. And so, I really need to commend Yash because he's done a remarkable job on this paper because many people all across the world for the last three or four years were trying to improve upon our previous state of the art. And they managed to improve some of these metrics, but then the other metrics would always get worse. So, for instance, people would try and increase the prediction accuracy or reduce the model size but then the training time and the prediction time of these new algorithms would uh, become unacceptably high. But for the first time last year, Yash uh, developed this stream model called Parable, which improves on all the metrics, right? So, it increases, uh, uh, sorry, as I said, it um, uh, makes training faster uh, significantly. It also reduces the model size from uh, terabytes to gigabytes. It increases the prediction accuracy while maintaining prediction time. So, we will be making the uh, code for Parable freely available on the extreme classification repository later on. And uh, in addition, uh, Rahul, Shrutendra and Anil made a number of domain specific contributions which helped our extreme classifiers to work really well on real world applications. And as a result of that, these class, our extreme classifiers have now shipped in a number of uh, um, products in Bing Ads in almost all the international markets. So, here is a small sampling of some of the uh, products and some of the markets ranging from dynamic search ads in the UK to text ads in the French market to product ads in, in Germany and, and so on. Right? And in each of these cases, our extreme classifiers are ranked either first or second in that long list of 50 algorithms which are uh, doing the same thing. And they are generating clicks that are in the double digits in each case. So, this was an uh, application in uh, advertising. Let me also uh, consider an application in recommender systems. So, we went and downloaded information about 3 million active Amazon items from uh, Amazon, obviously. And now, given the fact that the user might be interested in buying one of these items, in this case, a book on the rare wildflowers of Kentucky, what we'd like to do is to predict the other items that the user might also be interested in buying. So, this is the classical item to item recommendation task and it is traditionally solved using collaborative filtering and matrix factorization based methods. But we can again reformulate it as an extreme classification task where this time the input to the extreme classification function f is going to be the product description of this particular item and then the labels are going to be the 3 million active Amazon items. Right? So, if we look at the results, then we see that Amazon does not do a very good job it predicts only three or it recommends only three other books, uh, whereas it should have recommended a lot more. And if you look at our recommendations, then we recommend not only whatever Amazon was uh, recommending, but also more and with a lot more diversity. So, we recommend um, birds of Kentucky, wildlife of Kentucky, biodiversity of Kent in Kentucky, woody plants of Kentucky and so on. 
So if you look at the traditional approach to recommending items, it's based on collaborative filtering, where we take the ratings matrix, which is a matrix specifying which user likes which items, and then we try and factor this matrix as the product of two low rank matrices, one of them being a tall skinny matrix of user traits, and the other being a short fat matrix of item attributes. And then in order to determine whether to recommend bananas to the third user or not, what we do is we learn both these two matrices from our training data, and then once they've been learned, we take the row corresponding to the third user, multiplied by the column corresponding to bananas, and if the product is greater than a certain threshold, then we recommend bananas and otherwise we don't. Okay? Now, unfortunately, this simplifying low rank assumption that the ratings matrix can be factored as the product of these two low rank matrices completely breaks down at our level of complexity. And therefore, collaborative filtering might not make very good recommendations when dealing with millions of items. On the other hand, in extreme classification, we make no such assumptions. And in fact, we do not ever approximate the matrix as being low rank or uh, assume that there are linear distance preserving embeddings, etc. And because of this, we can make very accurate, uh, very good predictions, both accurately and efficiently, even when there are millions of items to be dealt with. So our algorithm for uh, warm start recommendation is called Swift XML, and it will be published in Wisdom 2018. And I should point out that WWW and Wisdom are the top tier conferences for this kind of research. And we'll also be making the code of, for Swift XML available shortly on the extreme classification repository, and all of you can try it out for yourselves. And I won't have time to go into the technical details, but the key technical contribution in Swift XML is that we can now train not only on uh, features from all the training points, but we can also leverage features from all the labels during both training and prediction. Okay. So let me finally cover just one more application, which is uh, somewhat related, but this time in the area of web search. So if you go to a search engine and submit a query, then it will recommend related queries that might have served you better, or it might suggest related queries that you could have asked in addition to get more information on the topic. So for example, if you go to Bing and search for uh, CAM procedure shoulder, Bing will recommend that you might try asking about CAM Newton shoulder surgery instead. Right? So this problem is known as related searches, and we can again uh, formulate it as an extreme classification task, where the input to the extreme classifier this time is going to be a query, and our labels are going to be the top 100 million queries on Bing. Now, as you can see uh, regarding the results, Bing again does not do a very good job. It predicts only one query. It should have done much more. And in fact, this query is not related to the original query, it turns out. So CAM procedure is, uh, stands for comprehensive arthroscopic management. It's a very specific type of shoulder surgery. Whereas Bing thinks that you're talking about the football player Cam Newton. And it predicts and it recommends you learn about his shoulder surgery instead. Whereas if you look at what we are recommending, then we also recommend a cost of an arthroscopic shoulder surgery, what to wear after a shoulder surgery, how long should you take off work after a shoulder surgery, uh, different types of shoulder surgery, and what should be music to the ears of the legally minded people in the room. We also uh, recommend shoulder replacement lawsuits. So the reason the traditional approach doesn't work well in this particular case is because the traditional approach is based on sessions. So a session is when a user comes in, types in a query, doesn't like the results that he sees, reformulates the query quickly, and then goes and clicks on something, right? So you know that the second query is a good recommendation for the first query. The first query didn't achieve the results whereas the second did, right? But if your input query, CAM procedure shoulder, is new, it didn't occur in any of the sessions, then most of these sessions-based methods will fail, no matter how much fancy machine learning you put on top of them, which is why Bing makes so few recommendations. And then even the traditional methods based on query similarity go for a toss, because these two queries seem to be very similar, right? So CAM procedure shoulder, CAM Newton shoulder surgery, they get embedded together, which is why Bing makes this mistake. Whereas if you look in extreme classification, then it has been designed specifically to handle unseen test points, right? So handling new queries like CAM procedure shoulder, which have not been seen before, comes very naturally. 
and we can make all of these good quality recommendations based on our extreme classifier, based on these deep learning features. So our algorithm uh, for this, uh, based on our deep learning features, is called Slice. And Himanshu has done a really incredible job with Slice because now Slice scales to 100 million labels, which is well beyond the pale of any other classifier out there in the world today. So we're going to try and submit Slice to KDD. And uh, hopefully, again, we'll try and make it available on the extreme classification repository. So I could cover many different applications ranging from tagging on Wikipedia to personal recognition on Facebook to learning universal deep features, uh, et cetera. But I don't want to go on and on. So let me conclude by just reiterating that extreme classification is a new area in machine learning, which not only helps us tackle web scale classification problems, but which also helps us re in reformulating key applications such as ranking and recommendation. Over the years, we've developed a number of algorithms for tackling some of these applications, and all of them are available on the Extreme Classification Repository. Parable and Swift XML will be available shortly. And so you can go and check out the repository where you will find not only our code, but code from lots of different groups around the world, uh, data sets, papers, benchmark results, etc., which will help you get started if you're interested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manik. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions if you're okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Vote so for PGN. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's that's done. So that's ticked off. Uh, if, you, if folks can raise their hand, we have people again with mics. Yeah, Srini. Just out of curiosity, is entropy still the guiding force for branching out? Uh, no. So as Srini is saying, entropy is where we started off with MLRF in 2013. It's a standard function to uh, try and split a node in a tree. From entropy, we moved on to NDCG, which is a ranking function uh, in FASTXML in 2013-14. Uh, sorry, 2014. And from there, we have moved on to uh, a slightly more advanced uh, uh, tree splitting function in Parable. So the criteria has changed. We've gotten better over time. It's one of the main reasons we have better accuracy now. There's a question at the back. Yes. Yes. Uh, IIT Guwahati, yeah, yes. you can introduce uh, uh, My name is Amit Avekar. Uh, I'm from IIT Guwahati. My question is, how these classifiers can adjust themselves when number of uh, the, the labels change over the time? Right, so uh, that's a very good question. Uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, talk about is that where I'm going with this, right, with the 100 million labels, is I actually want to build the next generation of search engines using extreme classification. So if I can get extreme classification to scale to billions of labels, then I can think of each document on the web as being a separate uh, label. And now I can train my extreme classifier so that when a query comes in, it can predict the subset of relevant documents. And now I can rank them on the basis of the classifier string. And I have a new kind of search engine, right? So obviously, in order to get that to work, I have to be able to uh, deal with labels changing all the time, right? Because new documents will be coming in all the time. So that's a new research project that we have going on at the moment. Uh, if you're interested in doing a PhD with me on that, please uh, come and talk to me afterwards. <laughs> this is my shameless Bing ad. <laughs> and uh, at the moment, I have two concrete options for you if you can't wait for a PhD. The first is that these classifiers are very fast to train. So as your label distribution changes over time, you should just retrain your classifier and redeploy. The other thing is that you can, uh, uh, with things like Swift XML, et cetera, because now you have features on your labels, you can say, okay, in this leaf node, I have these labels, they have these features, and this new label that came in, it's very similar to them based on the features, so I'll just add it over to this leaf node, and then you can start predicting that label as well. So you can apply hacks like this currently. Uh, for a more principled solution, you'll have to wait for a, a little while. Okay, any more questions? If not, we'll give a hand to Manik again. Thank you, Manik. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you.